reflect and to reset in a lot of ways. You know, and God is in the business of making things new. You know, the word new in the Bible appears over 200 times. New harvest, new king, new song, new heart, new spirit, new covenant, new life. We heard the scripture that Hugo referenced in Isaiah 43, verse 19. See, I am doing a new thing. No matter how hard the past is, you can always begin again. Thomas Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 17, the scripture says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and amen to that, if you're in Christ this morning, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. I'm here to tell you this morning that we must keep our eyes focused forward. We must keep our eyes focused on the beyond and not on looking back. We are not those who shrink back or look back because God has come to make new things. This morning, my title for the lesson is The New Has Come. Let's Come on, turn bro. our Bibles. Let's go, Fernando. Come on, babe. Samuel 21. The new has come. 2021 is here. And it's going to be an amazing year, family. First Samuel chapter 21. My first point this morning, a new refuge. First Ooh, Samuel 21 on, and in verse 1. Let's go. It says, David went to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech, the priest, the king charged me with a certain matter. And it said to me, no one is to know anything about your mission and your instruction. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have in hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us, as usual whenever I set out. The men's things are holy even on missions. They're not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread. Since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now, one of Saul's servants was there that day to tame before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, Saul's head shepherd. David asked Ahimelech, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's business was urgent. The priest replied, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. It is wrapped in cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There is no sword here but that one. David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. That day David fled, David fled from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, hey, isn't this David the king of the land? Isn't the one they sing about in the dances? Saul has slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. David took these words to heart and was very afraid of Ak Akish, king of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in the presence. And while he was there, while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, marking marks on the doors and the gates and letting saliva down his beard. Akish said to his servants, look at this man. He's insane. Why bring him to me? Am I so short of a madman that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Must this man come into my house? Chapter 22, verse 1. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. My first point, a new refuge. If you know the context of this passage, 
King Saul is now at the pursuit of David. He wants to kill David. Saul's son, Jonathan, really David's best friend in a sense, helps David to escape the presence of the enraged king. David here in this scripture, when you first read this, it appears to correctly depict them as seeking refuge in the house of God because he goes to the high priest. But the high priest, Ahimelech, says, hey, hold on a second. Uh, wh what are you doing here? Hey, where's your men? See, it was strange for the high priest to find such a prominent person like David. In David's stature, wandering in the village of Judea by himself. We know that a refuge is a place of safety, a place of shelter, a place where we run from danger and where we run from trouble. And here you have David running for his life. And he goes to the priest and the priest confronts him because he knows there's something strange going on here. And what happens after that? David says, look, the, 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 my king sent me on this secret mission. There was no secret mission. Saul wanted to kill David. David, at this point, blatantly lies to the high priests. He tells them, look, I'm supposed to be on this mission. But anyway, forget about that. Hey, I'm hungry. Can you give me some bread or whatever you got in, in your house? The priest tells him, hey, I don't have any ordinary bread here. The only thing they have is consecrated bread. In the tabernacle, which later became the temple of God, there was two rooms, two sections of it. In the first section was the holy place. Uh, in that area was a table. On this table were 12 loaves of bread that represented the 12 tribes of Israel and represented God's continual fellowship and continual sustainment of his people. Every day the high priest was supposed to get rid of the old bread and bring in new bread before the presence of God. Because in the next room, separated by a curtain, was the Holy of Holies, which was where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the Ten Commandments were, Aaron's staff, and this bread was considered to be, in a sense, holy bread in the presence of the living God. And here, the priest says, look, this is all I got. And he gives it to David. He gives him the old bread, and he puts a new one. David then, after taking this bread, doesn't stop right there. He says, hey, can you give me a sword? Do you have a sword? Number one, why would the priest even have a sword? And then he tells him, look, I had to leave in a hurry. I, I forgot mine. And David lies again. And he takes Goliath's sword, the Philistine sword. He is so happy to get this sword. He is quoted in the scriptures by saying, hey, there is none like this. Not once in this passage, running from his life running from a very challenging situation, does he ever go to God? David could have the sword of Goliath, but man, could he have a much greater chance of success if he was equipped with the faith that actually killed Goliath, but that's actually not where he's at. What happened to the Davids of Psalms chapter 86, where he says, among the gods, there is none like you, O oh Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. Or how about the David from 1 Samuel chapter 17? Let's turn there. Something happened to David. But let's remember who David was. David here in chapter 17. And in verse 38, he's about to fight Goliath. King Saul, who now wants to kill him, does something to David here in verse 38 of chapter 17. It says, then Saul dressed David 
in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried to walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch on his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. And we know that it just took one shot, and David brought down the giant Goliath. King Saul tries to put created things, things that belong to Saul. Saul, in this case, represents wickedness, a neglect of God. He puts his tunic, he puts his helmet, he gives them a sword. David, being a man of God, says, I, I'm not used to this. This is not how I win battles. Get them off of here. And what does he do? He grabs his staff, he goes over to the stream, and he grabs five smooth stones. See, David was a man depending on the creator for his victories and not those things that were created by man. This is why he throws it off. This is why he takes it off and he chooses to go down to the stream. You know if you're seeking God's deliverance by a sword, or by your own strength, depending on where you run in times of trouble. See, self-reliance is Satan's greatest weapon to sabotage your faith. We are day three into 2021. What weapon have you begun to use for the victories in your life? David takes Goliath's sword and depends on that to save his life. What does he do next? The Bible says that he flees. Does he flee to God? He does not flee to God. Rather, he goes to the, to the king of Gath. This was a Philistine king. In your mind as you're reading that you're thinking, David, have you lost your mind? These are the very guys that you used to fight against. You even tasted the bread of the presence of God. Why would you go to the enemy seeking protection? Have you lost your senses? See, when you are doing bad spiritually, you're going to make some dumb decisions. It's like when you go to the grocery hungry. Like, that's like bad news, Don't like Ray it. all over again. Do not go to the Amen. grocery store before Amen. you read. Come, bro. <laughs> You'll end up with so much stuff. You're like, what in the world? See, the people of Gath in the Philistine camp, they knew who David was. They recognized him. And they tell the king, hey, this is, this is David. This is the mighty David. That, that, that There's even a song about him. Saul king thousands, but David king tens of thousands. The Bible says that at this point when David heard these words, he took them to heart. And the Bible says that he was very afraid of the wicked king. It seems that at this moment, something finally clicked in David's heart and in his mind. He came to his senses. He had like a Luke 15 moment where the son leaves the home and goes and squanders his wealth. And finally, while eating pig's food, realizes what is going on? Why have I allowed myself to get to this point? I believe that David in this very moment is thinking to himself, how could I possibly have put myself in this situation with the enemy face to face? I truly have tanked it and I'm so afraid for my life. Let's see what happens and what how God made David knew after such a drastic spin out in his walk. Let's go to Psalms 34. Let's Come, go, on, Fernando. Fernando. Come on, bro. Let's go, Papa Nando. A new refuge. A new refuge. 
Here you're going to see the heart of David in this very moment where it finally it clicked and let's see what clicked and let's see what he did to eventually get him out of here of that situation. Look at Psalm 34 and in verse 4. This is David. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard me. He saved me out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil. Keep your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord, it is against those who do evil. What's incredible about what's going on in David's life is despite his foolish decisions, God makes things new in his life. He removes the old and he literally gets David out of the enemy camp. He gives him a new beginning. The psalm gives us insights into the heart of David at this very moment. Where was the state of his heart when he finally came to his senses? The Bible says he sought the Lord. And in that moment, God delivered him. God saved him from that very moment where his life was at risk. He was able to escape and he got a fresh new start. If you know the story of David... When he moved to this cave of Adullam, that changed his whole life. God gave him an army, and it gave him the victory that later he got, was able to get then enthroned as king. From the first Samuel passage, we know that David acted in a strange manner. He goes, he acts like he's crazy, scratching the doors and the gates, letting saliva down his beard as if David was out of his mind. David basically hum humiliated himself before this Philistine king acting like a madman. The saliva on his beard was especially convincing. See, what's important to understand is that in this culture at this time, this would only be done by a, ma a man who was out of his mind. Since David chose to seek God, God would make things new for him and guide him in a path of escape, but it would require to humble him. Almost like God is saying, okay, you chose to act crazy, then continue to act crazy if I'm going to get you out of this situation. And rightfully so. David was so sluggish to repent. It was arrogant for David to take such a long time to seek after God's refuge for his deliverance. See, the length of time it takes you to repent shows the depth of your pride and arrogance in your own life. When David first lied, the first time he lied, he should have come clean and should have sought refuge in God's man and in God himself. Instead, what does he do? He spirals. He goes from deceit to deceit, and his lies puts him in the company of the ungodly. David allowed himself to drift from God, even after everything God had done for him. Remember, David was just a shepherd's boy. He, he was out there tending sheep, and God selects him out of all his brothers. He anoints him. He calls him. He raises him up. He gives him victories. Thousands and thousands of victories. And yet here, 
despite even having tasted the bread in the presence of God, David forgets about God. And God yet sees that despite him drifting, is willing to make him new. When you drift from God, it happens in a subtle way. I remember many years back, for five years, I lived in Central America. That's where my family originally is from. My mom and my dad are from a country right underneath Mexico, a little country called Guatemala. That's where my family's from. Come on. And uh, I lived there for five years. It was a great experience kind of going to a third world country and really understanding just how, you know, have a, a bigger perspective on life. And I remember um, almost every weekend we did like a family thing with our extended family. I have a lot of cousins and uncles and aunts out there. And I remember going to the beach there and, um, uh, and, and the, our, my family was kind of a little bit off from shore, hanging out and having a good time. And I wanted to go play in the ocean. So I'm there playing in the ocean, you know, like a kid, just having a good time. And then without even knowing it, over time, little by little, like I, without even noticing, like the ocean was pull, pull, pulling me in. And, and, and where I had started, I had, it had pulled me in such a long way off. I was so far from where my family was at. And if you've ever been in the ocean, sometimes in the sand, it has like these dips, like almost like, almost like quicksand in a sense, where it, 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 it doesn't feel like you can get your bearings. And I landed in one of those, and I'm at this age, probably like seven years old. And literally, I'm like drowning, and I cannot get out. I cannot get out, and the waves keep landing on me. Fortunately, my uncle sees me, and he flat runs after me, grabs me out, and literally saves my life. It, was, it just took minutes for me to, of where I was and where I had drifted from. And as I came into this new year, it, it helped me reflect on the six years since Jackie and I have been restored here in the new movements. And I can tell you now what caused me to drift for over 10 years in our former fellowship. I literally got far from God. When I got baptized, God was my refuge. God was my everything. I loved God, I loved spending time with God, I loved getting into my Bible. I remember as a teenager, a sophomore in high school, having my quiet times in the morning, I couldn't do it inside my home. I used to live in this apartment complex and. And I wanted to find my prayer spot. And the only place I could go and pray and have my quiet time really early is I, would, I remember finding um, a spot in the, in the laundry facility of the apartment complex. And I, what I would do every morning, I would grab my Bible, grab my sweater, and I would go and sit down on top of the laundry uh, machines, read my Bible and pray. I loved God. I loved being in his presence. I, I, I loved that so very much. But little by little, the older, more spiritually I get in terms of kingdom-wise, tenure-wise, the more and more I stopped running to the stream and picking up the precious living stone in my life. And it took less work to just simply use my own weapons than going and getting closer to God. And it's crazy. I had tasted the bread of life. I had seen the miracles. I had seen God work in my life. But I was too arrogant to understand how far I had drifted. I was so out of touch. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says, We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so we do not drift away. Drifting starts in a very subtle way. You miss one quiet time, then another one. Or then you say, you know what, I'll just do it later. I'll just pray later. Uh, you know, I got busy, whatever, I woke up late. I'll just do it later. I'll do it tomorrow. Over time, you form a bad habit. And your time with God no longer is your daily first priority. And you begin to forget about what you heard. 2021 family 
is about choosing a new refuge, one that is long lasting, one that can sustain you. It's crazy not to be close to God. It's crazy not to pay the most careful attention to your time in the Bible. It's crazy to think that you're not going to fall away if you don't get out of your bed and into your Bible and on your knees or out and out and pray and get close to God. You're crazy. Come you're on, crazy. bro. You're going to be Let's here go. next year. You're, you're crazy. And if you don't believe me, then you're just as out of touch as I was. Because that's where I found myself, falling away, drifting farther and farther from the stream of the living God. And you're visiting with us this morning. God desires to produce in you a newness of hearts. No matter what your 2020 was like, the new has come. Get into the Bible. Let someone teach you God's word of what it truly means to seek after God. Make on, a bro. decision that 2021 is going to be a year, a moment in your life where you can go back to and reference and say, I did the crazy, craziest thing possible in 2021, and I did it right at the beginning. I chose to be urgently consistent in getting daily into God's word. It might sound like something small and simple challenge, but remember, David chose five small stones that gave him the great victory. Let's go to John chapter nine. Come on, Fernando. Go, Fernando. John chapter nine. Let's go, Fernando. My second Let's point. Go. This my is awesome. Second, my second point, a new vision. The new has come. God wants to bring a new beginning in our lives. And yes, we must seek a new refuge and we must have new vision in our lives. Here in John chapter nine, let's start off here in verse one. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened, so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming, when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told them. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, some claimed he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then? Were your eyes opened? They demanded. He replied, the man, the, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed. And then I could see. Where is the man? They asked. I don't know. He said, what an incredible passage. Jesus is with his disciples. And his disciples don't have yet a very deep conviction on the sovereignty of God. And they see a man with a limitation. He is born blind. So in their minds, they see a man with a great challenge. They see a man with difficulty. They see a man that maybe is in pain and suffering because he cannot enjoy the same things that everyone else can enjoy. And automatically they, they assume that it must be because he did something wrong, either himself or his parents. In their mind, that situation 
equals God punishment or God discipline. Jesus looks at him. He says, neither has happened. Rather, what has happened to this man is designed, was allowed, was done to demonstrate and to display the power of God through his life. Tyler Youngsma is becoming a prolific reader, and he shared a quote from a great book that he just finished reading called The Problem with Pain from C.S. Lewis. The quote goes like this. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks, to, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf ear. Did not God grab the attention, not just of you and I, not just of Dallas Fort Worth, but of the entire world in 2020 as pain came into this world? Where there is pain, where there is difficulty, where there is challenges, God is attempting to communicate a message to you. He wants to glorify himself through you, he desires to display the very power of God in your life. He desires to make you mighty. Jesus sees this man and he decides to spit in on the ground, mixes it with dirt, and makes some mud. Then he grabs it, he puts it on his eyes, and he tells him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Two things stand out here. Jesus is determined to make his sight new. Clearly, he wants the man to no longer be in this circumstance. He wants to give him vision. He wants him to see what he sees, but not in the manner that this man would have prescribed if he was the one in control and in charge of how he was going to see. What and why does he use spit? Why does he use mud? Jesus could have just spoken the words. He could have just looked at him. He could have just had the thoughts and his eyes would have been opened. I had a, I have a weekly quiet time with my daughter Andrea on Saturday mornings. We drive to Starbucks, grab some hot chocolate and a banana nut bread, get a pair of those together. Come and on. then we have a quiet time. And we're reading through the book of John together and we landed on John chapter nine, this very scripture. And I asked this question to Andrea, I said, Andrea, why would Jesus spit on the ground and why would he use mud? to deliver this man and to bring sight to him. And she says something that was profound and very deep. She said, Dad, I think that Jesus wanted to use something of himself to help the man see. And it's so true. Jesus uses something personal, something from within him to take something that is dirty, something that is mucky, it's something that no one wants to use or touch. And he uses that very thing to heal this great man. If that wasn't enough, he asked the man to go and watch. Remember, he cannot see. He is blind. This is a humbling moment for already a man in a humble state, an uncomfortable experience. And then and only then, if he actually obeyed it, would he see the great vision that God had for his life. He would have to ask someone for help to guide him. But imagine this. You're walking up to someone with mud on your eyes. Think about what a madman people would think you are. Like, what type of crazy are you? Why do you have mud in your eyes? But he was willing. He was willing to go and ask, and he was willing to obey because he wanted to see. How much do you and I want to see the very things that God has in store for our lives this year, 
This year will be a revolutionary life for many of you, but it will be for those who say, there's no limits, God. And you want to put mud on my eyes, put mud on my eyes. If you want me to go to that pool, I will go to that pool. If you want me to look like a, like a ridiculous fool to be delivered, then that's what I'm willing to do. Do you think that it's um, commendable in the eyes of the world for these four missionaries who are going to San Francisco to leave their home, to leave careers, to leave Let's everything go. else behind in the eyes of the world. They are madmen. They are crazy, but they want to see the very vision that God has for their life and for the great city of Contra Costa there in San Francisco. Woo. Without hesitation, this man goes, gets washed, and comes home in the very exact manner that Jesus said he would, he comes seen. He was tired. He was desperate. He was done. He didn't want to go and live another year the way he was. If this is what I got to do, then I am going to do it to be able to have a new vision. This needs to be the state of your heart. You need to get tired of the old, tired of what your marriage is, tired of your character is, tired of struggling with the same stupid sin in your life, tired of the same discipline issues, tired of the same evangelism issues, tired of the lack of fruitfulness, tired of whatever is in your life, you must get tired to be able to see the new vision in your life. Come on, Fernando. Come on, bro. What if all of us make a choice to get uncomfortable, to be willing to surrender ourselves to the very process of us being transformed, of accepting the very fact that we need what comes out of the living mouth of God to change us and help us see. Let's go, bro. I'm very proud of our dear brother, Mr. Luzolanu. Hopefully I did a good job. I believe Bob. in a lot of ways, Bob. he embodies this. He has a new vision and a clear vision for his life. I love Bob's Facebook post reflecting back on 2020. He said, this year was easy. The moment I accepted my destiny. My destiny is greater than my past, present, and dreams. This year, for you, it will be easy. That's why Jesus says, take my yoke upon yourself. It is easy. It is light. Once you decide to agree to the terms of Jesus Christ, what are his terms? You must be willing to give up everything do anything and go anywhere. If you must go to the pool call sent and be sent, then that's where I will go. Come on. <laughs> if you're willing to do that, then this year is going to be easy. The moment that you and I decide to accept the destiny for our lives. The blind man said, you're Jesus. I'm not. Let me accept what you say and act upon that. Sometimes I think that we want to be filled with the vision of God, with the direction of God, with the clarity of God, but it must be at our timing. It must be in our condition. Can we just not use some mud, Jesus? Can we make this a little less dirty? Can we make it a little more palatable to my taste? Can we do this in a way that doesn't require me to fall to the ground and die. Jesus says, no. If you want the new vision, fall to the ground and die. I came so that you can see. But you must do and walk through the same steps that I did. This year, you and I need to get washed of any fear, of any doubt, and dip ourselves in the scent waters 
of God's living word. The scariest thing that you can do in this life is live in regret. I want to lift up two people whose journey to the waters of baptism has not been without challenges, has had moments that were quite uncomfortable, but their desire for a new vision and their life has led them to where they are today. The first person I want to lift up is our dearest and youngest sister, our sister Kayla. Our youngest sister here in the church just got baptized yesterday. 17-year-old college freshman Let's go, who was supposed to get baptized several months ago. But as a result of receiving lots of persecution by her parents and being under the authority of her parents, she was put on hold in a sense. At that time, still living at home, herself and many disciples began to pray to God to open a door. She then gets a phone call from OBU. This is the college where she attends. And the phone call said, hey, can you graduate early so you come play basketball at OBU, but you gotta start in January. Kayla prays, she talks to her high school advisor, and he said, yes, you can graduate. That then enables our dear sister Kayla to leave the home, be emancipated in a sense, go and start college, and then yesterday enters the waters of baptism, Come on, Come on, Kayla. Go anywhere and do anything for Jesus Amen. Christ. Be praying for her as she understands the basketball might have been the door for her to receive salvation, but God has given her a new vision to go into the ministry. And God willing, here very soon at the end of this semester, she moves to Dallas, Fort Worth, and begins that very calling in her Come life. On. Let's go, vision. Yes. The other incredible story comes from the newly formed, defined Bible talk under the stern. Yes. This man, his name is Carlos, with a big heart for God, who will be getting baptized right after church today. This man has had to endure a lot, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering in his life, but I'm so proud of him because although pain can lead you to bitterness, although pain can lead you to resentment, he chose to deal with that pain and not make him bitter, but make him better, and he will be getting baptized soon after we're done with this Zoom call Let's today. Go, oh. Let's go, Carlos. Oh. Come on, Carlos. Come on, Carlos. 2020 was a great year for our church here in Dallas, Fort Worth. Yes, we did cross 100 disciples, but I am confident and with a shadow of doubt that God wants to do even greater things in 2021. After all, this is the year of mountain moving faith. I told the campus ministry last night, or two days ago, I guess, at our first devotional for the year, that our vision is that by the end of the year, that this ministry alone go from 50 disciples to 100 disciples in the campus ministry in 2021. Let's go. Our dear campus. Ooh, come on, campus. campus. Our dear campus disciples are now on the road to 100 in the campus ministry. Oh. Come on. I will be revealing our other goals and plans leading up to the winter workshop. So I hope to see you there very soon. Let's close in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go for it. Come on, bro. Preach it. Keep it coming, bro. The new has come, a new refuge, a new vision. Let's end where we started 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and in verse 17. Or 2 Corinthians, rather. 1 Corinthians is great. Have that for your quiet time. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Come on, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. This is an incredible passage. This morning, as we delve into God's word, I pray that you're encouraged by the fact that you are a new creation, or if you're like Carlos, that you can become a new creation very soon. I pray this morning that you see what God desires to do in your life. That he desires to take away the old and to bring in the new. Remember, regardless of how 2020 was, how last week was, or even how the last three days have been, I am confident that as we choose to have a new refuge, as we choose to have a new vision, that you and I will not just see what was done last year, but we will have the greatest year we've ever had as God removes the old because the new has come. I love you, family, and to God be the glory. Come, come on. on. Come 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 on